Hello, party people, and welcome aboard the Hurtigruten Nord Lease, uh, coming to you from my cabin on a seven day cruise up the coast of Norway. This is day two of the cruise, uh, and we're heading towards the Arctic Circle. Uh, it's been really great weather. I know we're heading towards the Arctic Circle, but it's been really great weather. It's been uh, in the low 60s every day. I say every, every day, the, the last two days. Uh, so it's been pretty nice, really nice for, honestly, I don't do a whole lot of excursions on stuff like this. I was mostly sitting on the hot tub, in the hot tub in the back of the ship. I was this close to filming in office hours from the hot tub itself, and I got ready to grab my camera gear, and more people came out into the hot tub, and I was like, well, I don't really want to have strangers in the hot tub video. So let's go through your top voted question. The number one is from Accidental DBA, who says, what are the best options you've seen for database deployment rollbacks for releases where errors are encountered by far and away? The best strategy for that is before you do it, test it. Just take the most recent restore, or the most recent backup of your production server, restore that database backup somewhere else, and then run through the deployment scripts. You should be able to run through those over and over again, restore the backup, run the deployment script, restore the backup, run the deployment script, until it goes all the way through without failing. Um, I, I'm a huge fan of doing this. I would, anytime we're doing any kind of production deployment, that's the way I would always insist on doing it. Um, if you have the size of database, one of my clients has a 25 terabyte data warehouse. If you have the size of database where you think, oh, I can't do that, that means it's time for you to look at, say, SAN snapshot backups, where you absolutely can do that. So by all means, even my client with a 25 terabyte data warehouse, they do that every single time. Because the bigger the database is, the less you can afford to go back when it screws up. Uh, so so why, why am I so insistent on it? Well, because if you have things like availability groups, log shipping, database mirroring, anything like that, uh, replication, you don't want to have to ever step the database backwards in time. Next up, Hera asks, what VM technologies should the SQL DBA know about for optimizing VM performance in Azure? Check out my class running SQL Server in Azure and Amazon, and I walk you through that. Next up, end try, begin cry, that always makes me laugh, asks, hi Brent, for large text columns like notes that I'm never going to index, is it better to have a Vercare Mac so the data is stored off page? Okay, first, because you're comparing that to a Vercare 2000, first you need to know that if the data isn't that large, it won't go off page. Just because you define it as a Vercare Max doesn't mean that SQL Server is going to store that data off page. There is a setting, um, and I forget, I forget the exact name for it, but at the table level, you can specify whether to default text, like Vercare Max, on row or off row. I don't remember what that exact setting is, though. Because here's the deal, it doesn't really affect performance that much, except when you're doing clustered index scans. Think about it, if you only need to fetch one record from a page, if you're saying select stuff where ID equals one, two, three, four, then it doesn't matter whether that large object is on the page or not. And in fact, it may help you if the object is on the page. The only time when having large text on the page hurts you is when you're doing table scans or range scans, scanning multiple records at once. But I would argue if you're doing range scans or table scans, you got bigger problems to begin with. And if you're doing it on a table of enough size where that kind of thing matters, you should probably be checking out column store indexes anyway. Next up, we have Ryan says, we admin a CRM server and from time to time we see high weights on CPU and high weights on resource semaphore. Where should we start? We feel like we've tried everything. You should start with my training class, Mastering Server Tuning, 
where I show you those weights, I show you what causes them, and I show you how to fix them. I know, Ryan, you thought you were born with all of the knowledge that you would ever need to become a database administrator, and it might shock you that some other people know more than you and want to help you in exchange for money. Someone has to pay for these cruises. Thomas Franz asks, my MSDB on SQL Server 2022 Enterprise is in full recovery model uh, because of things like job history. And so he chose to do this. When I install a new cumulative update, it's always set back to simple recovery. Any idea why? I don't actually, so Thomas, I understand why you're doing it. I understand why you're putting it in full recovery model. Um, you think that there's juicy gold in, I don't know the gold is juicy, but you think that there's some kind of golden value in job history data. Um, for, and for you, there may be. It sounded like I was being sarcastic. For you, there, there might actually be. The thing is, I, I've never seen anyone actually restore MSDB and uh, you, what usually what people just do is they go fail over to another server in their event that there was catastrophic data loss and you just rerun whatever jobs you, or the jobs pick up from there. Um, if you have the kind of situation where you need MSDB in full recovery, um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know that I would, I don't know that I've seen a good fix for that. You, now, you could open a support case with Microsoft and see if uh, they might support, because maybe there's a way that they would, support full recovery for MSDB. I don't think I've ever seen it. Usually MSDB is small enough, that, and especially stuff like job history tables, that what I would probably do instead is start, <coughs> excuse me, capturing that history in syncing it off elsewhere uh, for things like reporting purposes or just tracking in the event that systems fail. Uh, but I wouldn't rely on restoring MSDB. I, it's nothing wrong with what your plan. I understand why you did it. I just don't, don't think that you're going to find a lot of support for that. Uh, so what do most people do? They just try jobs again. Whenever they fail over, they go, okay, well, how much data, you know, how far back did we go? How much, how many jobs do we need to rerun? Because after all, if you fail over somewhere that's so catastrophic that you lost MSDB on the original server, you're probably looking at data loss as well. Uh, Tony asks, how many, did many people wear masks on the plane no, I, I think that, I, it's funny, I was talking to a friend of mine about this. Um, the, I, I think that there were maybe one or two people I saw in the airport who even had masks on in any of the airports. Uh, I would see like one or two people tops. Uh, and, and it's funny to me because during the pandemic, when I had to fly, you know, I would wear masks because I had asthma too at the time. Um, it, long story there, uh, and now <laughs> my brain, you can kind of see when my brain shuts down because I'm starting to think about it. I'm like, okay, so how much do I want to talk about that? You know, I, was, I feel like Mitch McConnell all of a sudden going offline there, but it's because I'm trying to decide what to talk about. Ooh, there's snowpack and uh, waterfall coming down from the snowpack there. I don't know if you can see it. I wish they would have washed these windows before each cruise. Um, but where was I? Uh, the masks. I, during the pandemic, I thought, well, I'm always going to wear a mask for the rest of my life. You know, I'm just, whenever I'm on a plane, I'm just, why would I not wear a mask? It doesn't cost me anything. Sure, I'll take it off to go eat or whatever, but uh, why would I not wear a mask? It's relatively harmless. Now, do I wear a mask? No. Nope. And the second part of Tony's question is, did you feel safe? Yeah, I, life is just back to exactly like it was before the pandemic. Part of that is that COVID isn't as big of a deal now. I think I've had it, I know I've had it for sure once. I think I've had it twice. Uh, it, it's not as big of a, a deal anymore. So I think that society's kind of uh, moved on from there. Or a lot of society, not everybody, but. Robert McTables says, you wrote a great post a few years ago, thank you, called How Much Memory is Normal for SQL Servers? Do you have any new data trends that you could share about newer SQL Server versions? N no, I have the data, I just haven't analyzed it recently. I, I don't know 
I would expect that um, the amount of memory that people use is dropping because in the cloud, it's harder to get low core servers with high amounts of RAM. Next up, Wicket says, why does SQL Server use the clustered index key in non-clustered indexes instead of the RID? That's fairly simple, actually. There is no row identifier when you use a clustered index. SQL Server just uses the clustering key so that that way, as objects move around, like when your row moves due to index rebuilds, due to page splits, whatever, SQL Server doesn't have to go update all the non-clustered indexes with the new RID. To learn more about the performance drawbacks of heaps and why RIDs are so bad, uh, you can check out my Mastering Index Tuning class in the Clustered Indexes module. Red Utley says, what is your opinion of using st Windows Storage Spaces Direct for hosting Azure SQL VM storage? Pretty bad, usually from a performance perspective. It's worse due to problems with networking, uh, that when you go to do a big network task like a backup, you're competing that network bandwidth for your SMB file traffic and for your backup traffic going out of the box. So it's common to see SQL servers go unresponsive during that time. And last up, Ozan asks, Hi Brent, from a security perspective, would you always enable TDE since otherwise data can be read in plain text via hex editor, or is there another way to encrypt the data file? There are databases where you don't need to worry about encrypting their contents. There are databases uh, with things that aren't customer data, things that aren't, you know, things that are logging, things that are configuration for your application where you just don't need to secure them. In that case, why pay the penalty, the performance penalty of encrypting and decrypting that data? In addition, uh, encryption is one of those features that because it's not on by default, not everything in SQL Server is tested well with it. Every time there's a cumulative update, you find that features that are kind of on the edge cases don't get tested quite as well. So there was a, a gotcha recently, I can't remember which CU it was in 2022, that if you used it was like file table and TDE together. You had problems restoring the backups. I don't remember exactly what the, the CU was. And I was just like, yep, I can see how that would happen because they're two edge case features that are hardly ever used either one and then you put them both together and like hardly anybody at all is using those. So the more edge case features that you use, the more of a risk that you take. You could make an argument that maybe all databases should be encrypted with TDE by default, not by you, but by Microsoft. You could totally make that argument. I could probably make a pretty good argument for that. In fact, I could even see writing a blog post about that. That's not a bad idea at all. Because if they built it in as part of the baseline of the product, then they would guarantee that all the time feature interoperability was going to be tested with it. I know they're not going to do it though because there is a performance overhead in terms of CPU of decrypting and encrypting the data. Uh, and that, that encryption and decryption is done at the page level since the page is encrypted in memory as well. It's decrypted every time it's read. So it, it does represent a higher CPU hit. You're, the next question you're going to ask me is how high is the CPU hit and you're going to have to, to go test that for yourself. All right, so there we go. It is a, another beautiful day here in Norway. I am, it's about 5.30 p.m. in the evening. The ship's restaurant is open for dinner now, so I'm probably gonna stumble upstairs and go uh, have myself some dinner. One of the things that I like about uh, Hurtigruten, this is my first time taking a Hurtigruten cruise, mind you, but one of the things that I like about them is they tend to focus on local Swedish food from each port, like the food changes every night. Uh, these are much smaller cruise ships, so they don't have huge dining rooms uh, like the big ones do. But they're they're uh, so each night they focus different food uh, on uh, different parts of Norway, which is kind of neat. 
Um, and uh, it really is a smaller ship too because we're going through the North Sea. Not right now. We're going through a fjord heading out into the North Sea. And I tell you what, the first night was rocking and rolling. I am on the tail end of the ship. I am on the very last cabin near the back because uh, I wanted to be near the hot tubs. Um, but the way that ships work is that they, uh, as they go through waves, the ends of the ship go up and down much more than the center of the ship. And so me being at the end of the ship, oh, I felt it. It was rocking and rolling last night. I don't get seasick very often on large boats, but this, I was like, oh, I can see how somebody would get seasick. Then this morning when I went up for coffee, I went up to the very front of the ship just to look around and see what the view was like as we were going through the North Sea. And there were a bunch of people who were camped out in the lounge uh, in their blankets and pillows sleeping in the lounge. Probably, I'm going to guess that they got uh, seasick uh, inside their inside cabin rooms because a lot of the, not a lot, maybe like a quarter of the rooms are inside rooms with no windows. And so you imagine being in a closed box with no windows and your body's doing this. Oh my God, I can only imagine how bad it was. This is also the first ship where I have ever seen seasick bags seasick bags in the rooms themselves. I've never seen anything like that before. Uh, and, and it's not that every, uh, in case of travel sickness, after use, please close the bag and place it on the floor. God, I would think that they would tell people to put it in the bathroom, but okay, whatever. God, that's kind of a terrifying thought. Uh, but these, so the, it's smaller ships and they're going through uh, the, uh, North Sea, which is very rocking and rolling, which is I find kind of fun. Norway's beautiful, especially the coast of Norway. It's a lot like Iceland in that there's waterfalls everywhere, real sharp, jagged cliffs, cute houses perched across the edge there. Uh, so just a beautiful ride so far. So thanks for hanging out with me. The next office hours will be north of the Arctic Circle. So I'll see you on the next one. Adios.